Thank you, Arthur, for that introduction. I'm conscious that on a recent occasion, the chair introduced me the words, some of you have heard the ambassador before, some of you haven't. Those of you who haven't will be looking forward eagerly to hearing him. <laughs> <laughs> some of the things I'm going to say tonight in a more jocular fashion are apocryphal. They did not happen. You do not need to worry about them. Okay? Because sometimes people say, didn't they really say that to you? I'd like to thank the Foreign Policy Association for invi inviting me to address you tonight on the subject of the United Nations. And let me begin by paying tribute to the FPA. You fulfill a vital role in reaching out to the American public to stimulate informed debate on global affairs. And in doing so, you help to promote a balanced understanding of the United Nations and the challenges which it faces. And for me, it's a particular pleasure to be introduced by someone who I met in my first week, actually, in the city. I was advised that of those who approached me, the one I should give particular priority to, by all my predecessors that I spoke to, was Arthur Ross. And can I salute your contributing and the contributions you continue to make to public life in New York. Today, I want to talk about the reform of the United Nations and to suggest how that reform can be taken forward. And let me stress from the outset, I do so from the viewpoint of a United Kingdom, which is a strong supporter of the United <coughs> Nations. And as such, we're convinced that reform is in the interests of all member states and in the interests of the United Nations itself. Let me start, if I may, by making the case for reform. It's worth reminding ourselves of the case for change. The world in 2006 has changed beyond recognition from the world of 1946 when the UN was founded. The pace of change, if anything, is accelerating. In recent years, political change, not least at the end of the Cold War, has seen new countries, new democracies emerge, Values which the United Kingdom and its friends have always held dear, such as respect for human rights, democratic accountability, transparent government, they've come to the fore. And in parallel with that political revolution, we've witnessed a technological transformation. Advances in technology over the past decades have been extraordinary. Barriers of distance and time have virtually disappeared. Opportunities for millions of people around the world, for example, graphically in China and India, have been opened up through global trade, financial liberalization, and enlightened development policies. But at the same time, our response to globalization has to be carefully judged to ensure that it reduces rather than exacerbates the divide between rich and poor. There are environmental impacts too, the ever-increasing demand for natural resources has a profound effect on our environment and our climate among the most pressing long-term challenges which we face. So change is constant and so is the need to adapt to change if we are to reap its benefits. The United Nations, the world's one universal organization, is no exception. If it remains static, its relevance will fade, and for me the case for change is clear and it's pressing. Now, if I may, let me set out in more detail what I mean by reform of the United Nations. Sixty years after its foundation, the UN is no longer an organization that simply services conferences and meetings. It has evolved into a, a global organization but among other things tonight has 85,000 peacekeepers deployed in 15 peacekeeping operations around the world at a cost in excess of $5 billion each year. Of a civilian staff of 30,000, more than half of those work in the field, not only in peacekeeping operations, but in political missions in countries such as Afghanistan and Iraq. They're engaged in vital tasks such as humanitarian assistance, human rights monitoring, electoral assistance, and so on. 
The demands on the United Nations are enormous. The challenge for the organization and its member states is to ensure that we can meet these and future demands rapidly, effectively, and efficiently. And that will require further continuing reform. For me, there are four essential elements to that reform. First, to update and strengthen the United Nations management culture. Secretary General Kofi Annan has been the architect of several reform efforts in 1997, 2000, 2002. But as he himself admitted last year, and I quote, many of these efforts addressed the symptoms and not the causes of our underlying weaknesses. They were not sufficiently comprehensive and strategic to meet the demands of an era of such rapid change. In several key areas, the operating model has not changed significantly since the 1970s." Unquote. And I'll come back to that aspect. Second, reform of the United Nations agencies, what you might call service delivery. The UN is central to achieving what we call the Millennium Development Goals, crucial for most of the developing world. But we're currently drastically off track. Now that the resources are being made available, a partnership between developed and developing countries established, the emphasis now has to be on the achievement of those goals. The UN aggregate contribution has to be focused and coherent. Today tend to be fragmented. I give an example. In Ethiopia today there are 23 UN agencies working. There are 14 UN agencies concerned with water. Now water and sanitation are important, but you don't need 14 agencies. The mandates of a myriad of UN agencies and their activities at country level are often overlapping, they're characterized by duplication and competition for scarce resources. The result is often to increase rather than to alleviate the burden on developing countries and to waste precious resources that should be targeted squarely at the implementation of the MDGs. Now, the United Kingdom strongly backed the request made by the leaders in the summit in September to Kofi Annan to bring forward proposals for a further reform of the operational architecture of the United Nations, that is, how we deliver service out there. The establishment of a high-level panel to make such recommendations is very welcome. That panel includes the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, and they're due to submit recommendations this autumn. He should ensure, I hope, a more coherent, effective United Nations presence at country level and a clearer, more rational structure and business practice at the headquarters level. Put simply, Development requires more coherence, greater efficiency, in at least three ways. Firstly, at the country level, the international effort needs to be better focused, less duplicative, duplicative and coordinated on the basis of the policies of the government of that country. We can't afford competition out there to try and disperse resources which are very scarce. Secondly, the contribution of individual United Nations agencies should reflect that strategy. That means each should contribute where it can best add value according to decisions made by its own governing board. But that means that when the UNICEF or UNDP board take decisions, it should be part of a clear worked out strategy. And above these levels, this is my third point, there needs to be a greater strategic direction which might encompass the United Nations contributions, that of the international financial institutions, whose disbursements dwarf very substantially the $10 billion or so that the UN system disperses each year, the other multilateral donors, national contributions. All that needs, in a very general sense, to be brought together, because at its heart is the need to address progress in implementing the Millennium Development Goals and the other goals which exist. And that, that needs to be done in a cooperative spirit, 
maximizing the positive outcomes for development. That whole effort, if we're going to liberalize new resources, it has to be dispersed and done effectively. Because this is, in my view, one of the last shots at policy. If we're going to get up to 0.7% of gross national income, public opinion, parliaments are not going to comprehend if, in fact, those disbursements are not made efficiently and don't produce the impact on the ground that they need to do. Now, reform of that architecture should complement, in my view, reform of the management culture of the United Nations. The consistent goal is a United Nations system better configured to deliver what the individual member states need, and sustaining this progress of change also requires more coherent strategic direction both within the system and from member states in the intergovernmental organs. Now third, and for that reason, we need reform of the organs of the United Nations. Just as we aim to improve the performance of the UN system, so we must strengthen the effectiveness of the intergovernmental bodies tasked with its oversight. This includes the Security Council. The United Kingdom is committed to further reform of the Council and equally its working methods. We've long supported expansion of the Security Council to include permanent membership for India, Brazil, Japan and Germany and two countries from Africa. But despite the best efforts of the so-called G4 countries and others, a way forward has not yet been found. This should not, however, in our view, prevent us from reforming the Security Council's working methods, where there's a strong case for greater openness and more transparency. Now, last year's World Summit agreed a reform of the Economic and Social Council, and that was very welcome. ECOSOC has, theoretically, a vital part to play in the oversight of UN activities. Yet, too often, it appears largely irrelevant, lacks a clear role that distinguishes, that distinguishes itself from its own subsidiary bodies or from the General Assembly. We should build on the need for change. And is there, for example, a role for ECOSOC to provide the strategic direction for development that I was talking about? But that means a fairly key position working with the international financial institutions and trying to set a global strategy for everyone. We should also look, of course, for progress in revitalizing and strengthening the General Assembly itself. Too much of the GA's work every year is routine, repeated with little change from the previous session, consuming vast amounts of time, energy and resources, and not often to good purpose. Now the fourth and final element for me in, is policy reform. The United Nations needs policies that respond directly to the challenges of the 21st century. Let me give you just a few examples. The creation this year of a peace-building commission, a human rights council whose members were elected yesterday, they're substantial achievements. They encourage, I think, an indication that the United Nations membership as a whole may be recognizing the need for change. Both bodies have the potential to reinvigorate the work of the United Nations in areas of conflict resolution and post-conflict reconstruction to build respect for human rights and hopefully end the polarized debates of the past. On terrorism, last week Kofi Annan proposed an excellent comprehensive strategy intended to strengthen our shared UN efforts to tackle terrorism. The onus is now on member states to deepen and broaden our cooperation. More effective action needed to counter this scourge as an integral part of the reform agenda of the UN. On climate change, global warming, one of the great challenges we have to confront. We cannot continue to keep our heads in the sand because progress is far too limited. And the UN has a key role to work out how we get a global framework for the post-Kyoto period. If you think about your personal health, that if your individual temperatures go up by one and a half to two degrees centigrade, you've got a fever. If the world's oceans have gone up 
by that much over the last hundred years. Just think how much heat had to come from somewhere to do that. It's immense and the physics of that dictate that we have to grapple with that problem. On development and implementation of the Millennium Development Goals, we need to give individual countries every assistance and encouragement to put in place programs so that we actually implement the goals. Now what do I mean by that? I mean that girls can have some prospect of going to school, that kids can look forward to a certainty of at least primary school education, that maternal mortality rates can be drastically reduced, that we tackle the big diseases out there, and so on. They're very real, substantial challenges. And the injection of official development assistance, which will flow from the commitments last year, enshrined in the Glen Eagles G8 agreement, they have to be utilized to that purpose. And I just put you the figure that 50 million, sorry, 50 billion dollars extra will be available up to 2010. That's the scale of what is available. Now, I've sought to outline key areas where I think UN reform is required. But in what I now go on to say, I want to focus on the crucial issue of management and cultural reform of the organization. Now, this is an area ripe for management consultants. As Arthur said, I come from Wales, and a man walking along an empty road recently came across a shepherd with a huge flock of sheep in the field. And so he bet the shepherd $100 against a sheep that he could accurately say how many sheep were in the field. The shepherd accepted the bet. The gentleman said there are 973 sheep. The shepherd said, that's amazing. That's absolutely correct. Take the sheep. So the man picked up the animal, and as he was walking away, the shepherd said, I'll bet you now, I'll go double or quits, but I can say what your profession is. So the gentleman took the bet, and the shepherd said, you're a consultant, aren't you? He said, yes, but how did you know? Well, said the shepherd, if you put down my dog, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you're still awake. I'm pleased about that. Now, the reality is that management reforms underpin all other reforms. And to underestimate their importance is actually very dangerous. As the Secretary General said in his most recent package of proposals, and I quote, failure to carry through reform in any one of these areas can greatly reduce or even nullify the value of reform in all the others, unquote. We share the Secretary General's view of a United Nations better able to respond quickly to global developments and emergencies and to serve better the people of its member states. As Tony Blair said at the World Summit, and you know, I have to, in all my speeches, quote Tony Blair, <laughs> quote, the United Nations must come of age, unquote. That means a competent United Nations, able to deliver services in a cost-effective and efficient manner. It should not only produce reports for the consideration of member states, but be a truly active partner able to deliver peacekeeping services, public information services, humanitarian assistance, and so on. Now, a reformed United Nations does not necessarily mean a smaller UN, nor does it mean a UN automatically operating with a smaller budget. But it is about a smaller strategic center and a greater focus on field-based activities making a greater impact. It's also about improving systems and regulations at the center in order to allow those in the field to focus on effective delivery. The UN must have the necessary IT infrastructure, infrastructure to allow it to move into the 21st century, not only in terms of communication, but also to allow it to take the budgeting process to the next level and ensure that resources are aligned to priorities. Only then will it be 
better able to assess how member states' money is being spent and whether resources are being allocated in the most effective manner. That applies to corporations, it applies increasingly to government, it must apply to the UN. And a reformed United Nations should mean that its Secretary General has the necessary tools at his disposal to manage the organization as he sees fit. At present, Kofi Annan does not. Let me give you just a few examples. Apart from a small measure of existing flexibility, the Secretary General cannot move even one staff member nor one dollar between any of the separate 35 sections of the United Nations regular budget, the running cost of the organization, without seeking the explicit approval from the Fifth Committee of the General Assembly. Similarly, we cannot upgrade or downgrade any of several thousand staff positions. He cannot use the dollar equivalent of a personnel slot for non-personnel related activities. He can't move funds from one peacekeeping mission to another. Just a handful of a whole range of examples which I could quote. And that's no way to run a multi-billion dollar um, outfit globally engaged in the 21st century. I doubt whether any individual ambassadors in the General Assembly would allow themselves to be so fettered in the way they run their own missions, yet they seek to control the Secretary General of the United Nations. So what we need and want is a Secretary General who has clearly defined limited flexibility to interpret the decisions properly taken by member states. At the same time, he has to be accountable. There have recently been too many scandals and allegations involving the United Nations stemming from failures of its management, and those play directly into the hands of those who are content to micromanage the functioning of the organization. So accountable flexibility is what is in order. In terms of its personnel, we want the UN to have a central cadre of staff able to address the needs of the organization, but also a flexible wider pool of highly mobile staff capable of working in field operations. Staff cannot flourish unless they have a clearly defined career path supplemented by targeted training to ensure that their skills remain relevant. That's obvious, but it is not the case. So we need the improvements to be accompanied by a workable performance assessment mechanism to ensure appropriate rewards for better performance. We need the best and the brightest within the Secretariat to be able to rise and fulfill their potential. The UN staffer of the future is someone who may have experience gleaned elsewhere, whether in the public, private or voluntary sector, but who is recruited, especially at the most senior levels, on merit and only following a transparent recruitment process. At the moment we lack merit and we certainly lack transparency. In parallel with management reform, what we're pushing for are tangible results from the process of reviewing all the mandates which currently apply to the main organs of the United Nations. What I mean by that are the instructions given to the Secretariat for programs, for work to be carried out, and which have continued largely unchanged for many years. So what we want is a review which actually identifies the lower priority or the duplicative activity. And mandate review is not necessarily in order to cut costs, but it is a long overdue look at whether resources and priorities are aligned and whether those mandates now require to be updated. Now, we know how difficult accepting change can be. Indeed, I sometimes think that we'll need a miracle to effect change within the United Nations. Back in the 70s, Golda Meir, I think it was, was asked how whether 
Soviet troops would ever leave Central Europe. And she opined at the time that they might do that in two ways. Firstly, there was the natural way. That is to say, a host of heavenly angels could come and pick up every single tank and every individual soldier and transport them back to the Soviet Union. And alternatively, there could be a miracle. They'd leave of their own accord. <laughs> well, actually, the miracle happened, of course, happily. But what I do agree entirely with Kofi Annan is his assertion, and again a quote, that reform is a process, not an event, unquote. And that the culture of reform needs to be established and things have to change. There's a perception that votes or reports in themselves constitute action or change. In practice, reports and votes enable and authorize change, but change in itself is the long march that should then follow. The ultimate goal of all member states should be the same, to ensure a well-managed, innovative, results-oriented secretariat which serves the interests of all countries. Anything less risks diminishing the value and the role of the United Nations. Now, there are a number of persistent misperceptions which undermine reform and change. Some developing countries are suspicious that the West or the North will somehow exert undue influence over the Secretary General should he be given that greater flexibility to run the organization as he wishes. The inference is also that the West will then move funds away from G77 priorities, such as development, and put them elsewhere. In my view, that's quite plainly just wrong. And it's equally wrong to see flexibility as a, a diminution of the power of member states. The intergovernmental process should determine the extent of the delegated of, of flexibility, and crucially, insist that the real accountability should then follow for the exercise of that flexibility. In parliamentary terms, that's Parliament holding the executive responsible. Despite the wishes, the belief of the General Assembly that they exercise control, in reality the implementation of programs is seldom checked and the Secretary General is not held accountable. This is not targeted at Kofi Annan, it's targeted at the office, that the senior members of the UN should be more accountable. Now, on the 28th of April, um, that mistrust and suspicion led to the G77 group of developing countries departing from the established method of working by consensus in the UN's Budget Committee, and instead they forced through a resolution and voted on a resolution on the Secretary-General's outline reform proposal. In a way it sounds quite democratic, doesn't it, to vote, but there had been a very long-standing tradition and indeed a delicate balance on budgetary issues between those who paid most of the contributions and between the numerically superior developing countries. And that was an understanding but it was in both sides' interest to work for consensus and reach decisions that everybody could rally to. But what happened was that the Secretary General's proposals were undermined because before they even had an opportunity to be discussed by the General Assembly, the larger grouping, the 133 G77 countries, decided that they didn't want them, and that was it, voted against them and forced that vote on Monday through the General Assembly. So we're in no doubt that the present system of attempting to approve budget is broken. We need to tackle this. National parliaments, coming back to that, don't generally consider the detail of budget proposals through a committee made up of every single member of the House, every single party, and require that every decision should be taken by consensus. That's why the present system in the UN is chronically inefficient. And some of the Secretary General's proposals were tailored 
to try and address that particular aspect. So it's frustrating that the General Assembly itself denied itself the opportunity to go into the logic of those proposals and to debate and pass change, and instead decided that these were inappropriate for the United Nations. That's why the United Kingdom, the United States, the European Union, and a total of 50 countries voted against that resolution on the 28th of April. And contrary to assertions by the chair of G77, this was not a consensus resolution. It comprehensively failed to incorporate the views of others and simply ab initio actually said, this is what we believe, we don't want this change, and we're saying now no, and it doesn't matter what the rest of you think. That's why we have to come back to this and work for, for change and for a better atmosphere. It's at this stage that I, of course, run the risk of losing my audience. Quite recently, I found that people were drifting away at this moment, and by the end, one solitary person was left. I went up to him afterwards and said, well, thank you very much for staying the course. He said, well, I'm the caretaker, and I have to lock up after you. <laughs> now, implementing change and communicating the logic and the cause of change is key. Change has to be within the parameters set by the member states, but also the senior United Nations staff in the Secretariat and the agency have a heavy responsibility. Because change can, by its nature, be very unsettling for those directly affected. I recognize that. A real effort needs to be made to secure staff buy-in and to communicate the potential benefits of change. That needs to take account of the present imbalance, where the majority of United Nations workers are in the field, operating in extremely difficult and dangerous conditions. They enjoy few of the benefits of staff working in high-cost duty stations such as New York, and most of them are on short-term contracts under 12 months. It's the New York part who voted against change. They're the ones who passed a resolution condemning the Secretary General for his proposals. They discounted the interests, of course, of those outside who were going to profit rightly from change. And that's why we support the idea of having a change management office within the United Nations Secretariat. Not only would this work with key leaders to plan and coordinate the implementation of reform, but it would also monitor performance and hold individual heads of department accountable for their delivery, necessary to cascade change through the organization. So how do we now go forward? I think we need a simple package for the next two months, which should have the following elements. Firstly, a clear understanding that the Secretary-General can take forward specific examples for change in areas within his competence. He should not be restrained. Secondly, there should be progress on proposals where we can reach rapid agreement in the next few weeks. That should include management elements, allowing the Secretary-General discretion to move staff and people, to reclassify staff within the organization to deal with emerging priorities, to strengthen the procurement rules, and some initial consolidation of these range and uh, myriad of mandates which exist out there. Now, it may seem strange, but I have to put out the case in such simple terms for what seems blindingly obvious. But the fact is, as someone once said, you know, inertia can have its own momentum. And that's <laughs> part of what we face. There's an inbuilt resistance to change. So we need agreement as well on a process by which the other elements, the other proposals, will be considered and taken forward with a commitment to see that they're discussed rationally and sensible decisions taken. And with that, of course, will have to be a decision that the spending cap of $950 million on the, this year's allocation 
for 2006-7's budget, that that should be lifted, because the United Nations otherwise will run out of money in mid-June. And that's the crisis which looms. Now, I'm, don't worry, I am going to come to an end. Um, the long-winded British politician, two hours into his speech, came to that epic line, I'm speaking not only to you, but to generations yet unborn. <laughs> and someone shouted, if you don't hurry up, they'll soon all be here. <laughs> now, let me come to my conclusion. After the Iraq crisis three years ago, Kofi Annan said that the United Nations was at a fork in the road, that phrase which has reverberated around. Those divisions of Iraq have been largely put behind us. Yet we now find ourselves at a no less critical juncture. Decisions are needed on the future direction of the UN organization itself. And a crucial decision looms on whether we provide the resources which the UN needs for the rest of 2006. And already there are voices out there saying, well, we're not going to agree. I regret the fact that a majority of countries in the General Assembly refuse to debate the modest and reasonable reform proposals which Kofi Annan had put forward. Countries like the United Kingdom at a kingdom and our partners in the European Union who believe passionately in the multilateral system in the United Nations, we see no contradiction between strong support for that purpose and aim of the UN and our equally strong realization that the UN desperately needs reform. Reform so that it can better deliver its essential services, peacekeeping, development, humanitarian relief. Reform so it can prioritize and plan ahead, reduce bureaucracy, waste and duplication. Reform for the needs of this century, including particularly for development and peace building, not be constrained by the divisions and the policies of the past. The reason I've stressed management reform is that it's pivotal to the success of the broader reforms which have already been enacted, as well as those under consideration in the United Nations. We want the reform efforts to result in a more effective and efficient United Nations, which operates transparently and flexibly with real accountability at its heart. This will permit us to meet the interlinked challenges, the development, the security, the human rights, and a more effective multilateral system with a revitalized and reformed United Nations at its center is for the British government one of our main foreign policy objectives. And we do that consciously because a multilateral solution is preferable to the unilateral if we can get everybody to a common set of objectives and to agree what should then be done. But for the, cr the future crisis to be averted, what we all now need to do is raise our sights to stop hanging on to the practices of the past, to invest instead with confidence in the future and to show the degree of foresight that is necessary. That means casting aside suspicion of motives avoiding what has been called the arrogance of the majority or the arrogance of the contributors. It means rebuilding confidence between nations and groupings. And we should recognize the importance of consensus, of agreements on the way forward. And above all, we should come together to secure the future of a modern United Nations, driven by the nations and for the nations, and fit for the purpose of better meeting the challenges of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Ambassador Jones Perry, thank you very much for those insightful remarks. Uh, I'd also like to thank Arthur Russ for endowing this lecture. And the ambassador has very graciously agreed to take questions, so we'll open it up for questions. Sir? You're a very politician.
kind of point there is announced that it will not seek another term. Uh, what will the succession be of, of his party? And what about Mr. Cameron and his party? I, I think the ambassador referred to himself facetiously as a, as a politician. I was talking about other politicians. I have no claim to be a politician. I'm a humble civil servant. And I, I've served Mrs. Thatcher, John Major, Tony Blair, even Jim Callaghan. So I'm, I'm, I go back a long way. So the answer to your question is that will be determined by the political process, and I will serve whatever emerges from it. I will simply give you this as an example, though. I went to bed on Thursday night. My foreign minister was Jack Straw. At 6 a.m. I listened to the BBC World Service tell me that a change was afoot. It turned out to be the biggest change since 1962. It appalled me when I was in the office and I said, this is like the night of a long knives. Never, no, none of my colleagues could remember what I meant. But it was 1962 after all. But by, let's think, 6.30 our time on Friday morning, Margaret Beckett was the new Foreign Secretary. At 10 o'clock, I happened to need decisions about what was going to happen here on Monday for various meetings connected with Iran. And at 10.30 our time, the new Foreign Secretary took that decision, and she was here yesterday and the day before and carried on. We go through what we would call a more rapid transition, perhaps, than the United States when we go into transition. Maybe I could ask you a question about um, the United Nations Development Program. Uh, we're looking forward at the end of this month to having the UNDP Administrator, Kamal Dervish, uh, address us. And uh, I guess at a time when many donor countries are uncertain about their development strategies, uh, how, what's your appraisal of the uh, UNDP and how is it being affected uh, by the current uh, reform effort? Well, I'm not sure that countries are uncertain. If I look at um, the British performance of the European Union, we've signed up emphatically that by 2015 we will have 0.7% gross national income spent on official development assistance. Um, the uncertainties which might have been there, the reluctance to spend, has for many of us been replaced by a determination that we really have to do it. So from the view of the donors, what we agreed in the run-up to the summit in September and confirmed in the summit was a commitment that the donors would honour their obligations. What we're saying, of course, is that the recipients have to fulfil their part of the bargain. And that means policies on governance, on tackling corruption, on putting in place democratic institutions, having economic policies which are rational. All those things are part of the bargain. And then we say the money's available to implement these goals. As to the UNDP, their basic, and Kamal Davis is a member of this panel which is looking at the future coherence of international assistance, and UNDP, I think, you have to look at in terms of an agency which has gone through a lot of reform, but knows it has to keep reforming, and under now an administrator who is, after all, a senior figure in the World Bank, a Minister of Finance of Turkey who reduced an 80% inflation rate down to about 11%, and it had been 80% for the last 10 years at least. Um, a very sizable figure, and he's taken on that role. So I think the UNDP is very much to be congratulated as an ongoing contrib contributor to dispersing. And it does, in the UN system, we disperse about $10 billion of assistance per year. But I would say this, that Mark Mullock Brown has several times publicly and he was the former administrator, he said publicly that as the administrator of the UNDP, he had infinitely more flexibility to run and change his organization than the Secretary General does. And that comes back to the problem. UNDP was capable of being reformed. The United Nations is fettered by the present arrangements. How much opposition do you see in expanding the Security Council? I think there's a, a widespread acceptance that the Security Council should be expanded. The problem is who should be the new members. And the problem is that there is a series of discrete op opposition to the possible new candidates. And if you put those candidates together, 
there is sufficient overall opposition to somebody within that package that it's very difficult to see how you can muster the 128 votes that you need. That's the dilemma, um, because um, each country brings with it a certain amount of baggage about someone who doesn't want them to be a permanent member. So at the moment, I don't see any prospect of early progress. Mr. Lady. Ambassador, I speak as a very strong supporter of the United Nations. And one of the most important things you can say about it is that it exists. I rather doubt if you have to put it in this crash the day you do it. But having said that, I must admit to being something of a cynic and a realist in two aspects. First, it's against human nature to expect the present uh, members of the Security Council would veto the power to give up that power. Second, um, I cannot think of any example in recorded history of a bureaucracy reforming so. itself. <laughs> uh, having said that, I do wish to make uh, a suggestion on which I uh, request your comment that this whole problem of the disconnect between the spending authority and the responsibility must be addressed and perhaps it could be addressed by turning the United Nations into more of a federal system, uh, much like there is in America, whereby the responsibilities are regional, but everything's here at headquarters in terms of what you do. Let's say I, do, I don't see anything in the Charter which would forbid this. If you were to set up regional state UNs in Africa, you know, in the main region, then each of these many UNs would have the responsibility of coming up with the projects they want for their region, which was where, where they want to spend money. They would put in a package to the center. So, Robert, I, I think the ambassador's probably got the gist of the, of the, of the so, remarks. So what I'm okay. saying is yeah. that uh, each, let's say Africa, They've got to get together and say, this is what we want to do. And particularly when it comes to peacekeeping, they've got to come in and say, this is what we want to do, and it's very important there, and this is what Africa will do in uh, putting in our own uh, troops as part of it. So the question is, do you think a federal system will be helpful to the United Nations? Let me start. I didn't address the veto because I don't think the veto touched on any of the arguments I made. As for Security Council members giving up the veto for those that have it, um, my problem is that the other organs and the Secretariat need reform. And I look, and I don't say this just because I'm a permanent member, I do think the Security Council, on the whole, takes decisions and acts more responsibly and quicker than any other part of the United Nations system. But coming on to this argument about the relationship between the centre and the regions, it, to a considerable extent we're moving in the sense that the links between the African Union and the UN, for example, are being consolidated. What's happening in Darfur tonight is that under the umbrella of the United Nations, the AU is doing the job on the ground, but a whole range of policies are being put in place by the United Nations, but also by the European Union, we're all contributing to that. The Africans are promoting change. If I look at NEPA, the new economic arrangements, they're driven by Africans, for Africans, and are being supported by the rest of us. Peacekeeping efforts, you know, most of the peacekeeping is done either by the subcontinent or by African states. It's not done by the European Union or the United States. So they are bearing their burden. What I couldn't accept, I think, is the suggestion that the Africans should decide what the priority should be on peacekeeping or whether or not there should be peacekeeping, because fundamentally that is a responsibility for the Security Council, which is charged with the maintenance of international peace and security. We can subcontract after we've decided consciously what we're going to subcontract to the African Union, 
under chapter 8 of the Charter, but we should maintain who is responsible. And after all, fundamentally, with the budget and the universality of membership of the UN, we're not going to get readily member states to accept any arrangement where they've delegated in advance decisions elsewhere. So I think the federal structure per se is not going to happen. I'll end by noting that we have regional commissions. They t consume a huge amount of money. They never, ever cross my desk. And I'm involved in quite a bit of what the UN does. So I have to wonder what the regional commissions, with the huge budgets they take on, what do they actually contribute, which would argue for me for a rationalization of part of the regional dimension. Jeffrey? Yes, um, I regret I didn't follow the budget debate recently as closely as I should have done, but I, I wondered if part of what was going on was the frustration amongst the 77, the lack of support of the Security Council and then not uh, certain of the larger countries, the emerging markets like Brazil or in India, are not getting the opportunity to participate at the level of the Security Council. And I'm not suggesting a change in the veto, I can't see that ever happening the general broadening of the, uh, uh, the membership from those other regions of the world. I'm not sure that's right, for two reasons. Firstly, the expansion is not happening because the General Assembly itself cannot muster the majority. And that's because fundamentally the G4 countries and their supporters can't find common purpose with the Africans and they're opposed by those, and there are quite a few of them, who believe the answer is not to have any more permanent, but to have more elected members. It's got nothing to do with the Security Council itself. There may be frustration, but they're not on there. But it's unfair, I think, to target it at us. That's part of my reason. But the other reason is the fundamental one. Change which affects the power of individual countries, as they see it, the belief that at the moment they are holding the system accountable, Actually, they hold it to ransom. They don't hold it accountable. And that in this process, they can therefore, as small countries, exercise a voice when the big powers, the permanents, have all the power, not just in the Security Council, but it's they who've got their arms up the back of the Secretary General and that they are determining everything. That's the popular belief. All I can say, if only it were so. It's not. Um, but it stems from more a worry that power is being taken away. Well, my argument is that if you change the system, you will end up with more power, more accountability, but more efficiency. Yes, sir. The uh, American Journal of International Law uh, stated several months ago that Britain brokered a late hour deal sending the, Darfur, uh, the perpetrators of Darfur to the ICC. Do you see the UK's role as a moderator in the Security Council? And how do you see the UK role uh, in terms of reform? It is the case that on the ICC, that um, what started as a resolution with nine co-sponsors ended up in a very fraught and um, tense day with one country alone prepared to sponsor. Um, and that country said, when the council reconvened, if the president of the council could ascertain that there was a majority for that proposal and that there was no veto against it, then the United Kingdom would sponsor the resolution. And we sponsored conditions having been met and it went through. Um, I don't regard my role as being to moderate between, and I'm not in mid-Atlantic or somewhere off the Irish coast. Um, what the UK stands for is an efficient United Nations. We stand for lots of things which are by the standards and the expectations of others, uh, rather forward. I believe in the responsibility to protect. I won't sit back and see Darfur continue. If there's another Rwanda, the UK will be in there arguing for change. We're pushing that agenda, and we push so as members of the European Union, but standing up for values and principles that we're attached to, and which my government expects me to push and further at every opportunity. It does follow on occasion the United Kingdom has a particular role, but has nothing to do with moderating. It's an accident again of language because the 
common language out there is English. And when we get into difficulty in negotiation and we're trying to find solutions, the cry always goes up for mother tongue English people. And the problem is that the British ambassador is not mother tongue English, but he does his best and we get, we get through. Um, Sir, you have the last question. In 1946, the United States was a prime mover in the creation of the United Nations and a principal funder. It seems to me that the power centers of the world have to be behind radical reform, as you suggested. What indications do you see that the current ambassador from the United States supports the spirit and substance of your remarks this evening? Well, that's a very easy last question, so let's make it the penultimate question, because what I don't uh, ever answer is questions on individual colleagues. You'll forgive me, but I find it better not to. Can you have one last question, please? <coughs> In that case, I... Ambassador Wiesner, why don't you put a question? Before? I I was agree uh, what happened in this what the uh, ambassador uh, said about the need for uh, for reform. The uh, question is how to achieve it. Uh, do you see a movement now that would uh, uh, combine two groups, let's say uh, countries, those who pay uh, for reform, like the United Kingdom, and some perhaps uh, representation of uh, G77 and uh, under perhaps the EGs of Kofi Annan or something to start uh, a really serious dialogue because I personally feel there is the need to move forward and to achieve it uh, I would say we need further dialogue. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree on where you ended up in your question. Uh, fundamentally, we need to win the battle of minds. We need to get over suspicion, persuade people that this is good for the organization, that it doesn't impinge on any of our individual interests, but actually it strengthens an organization which we should all be attached to. That's the goal. I don't see the Secretary General as being really a main player in this. He is, in a sense, he makes proposals and he's a catalyst for certain things. But in the end, this is an intergovernmental process. And in the last uh, nine months, where the Secretary General has tried to intervene constructively, he's been much criticized for appearing to take sides with one group against another. Actually, what he was doing was supporting reform. But he was seen and perceived as being supporting those of us who were arguing for reform. And it brought into question his impartiality, as seen by the G77. Now, I think that's absurd. If you are, and this is part of the problem, the Charter talks about the chief administrative officer, but if you are that person, you should be allowed to get out there and do your job. And when you have difficulty, you should be able to report that and expect support. Of course, if the Charter said you're the chief executive officer, and you could get on with executive being an executive function, um, that would make life much easier. The problem for the Secretary General is that whenever that post sticks his or her head above the parapet, somebody always shoots at you. And that makes it rather difficult for the Secretary General to be up front as much as he would like to. Well, it has to be said in the last 12 months, he's been conspicuously advocating and proposing change. I thank the Ambassador for gracing our forum, and I just uh, I think it's, it's extraordinary that the Jones Perrys are uh, entertaining at their home this evening, and they're clearly very well organized that they can be with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.